This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. All right, we'll go ahead and get started now. Welcome to EE380, the Computer Systems Colloquium in the Electrical Engineering Department at Stanford. Today's speaker is Fabian Kloss, and he's going to be talking to us about design for yield. So how many people have heard of design for test? OK, that's everybody. And then how many people have heard of design for yield? And then that's maybe just half the people. So as the silicon geometries are shrinking, the IC manufacturing process has more variations in it. And so designing for yield or designing for manufacturing is starting to become important. So that's what he'll be talking about today. Before he gets started, I just want to give you a, a bit of background on Fabian Kloss. He has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the Tucumán National University in Argentina and a master's degree from the Technion in Israel. And then he got a PhD in electrical engineering from the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. After that, he then worked at Sun Microsystems and was the chief circuit engineer there for the UltraSpark 4 Plus. And he worked on four different generations of the Spark architecture there. He also did research at Stanford as a, um, as like a guest visiting scholar. And he was a lecturer at Santa Clara University during the time he was at Sun. Recently, in 2004, he went and joined Palo Alto Semi, or PA Semi. And he's been working there as the Director of Technology and Manufacturing. His focus there has included circuit design, timing, working with the foundry directly, and also doing product engineering. So please welcome Fabian Kloss. Thank you, Ellie. All right. So um, uh, before I get started really with the topic of today, I will just have a couple of slides about, you know, PA Semi. I don't know how many of you know about, you know, uh, this company. So, um, so this is what, you know, our marketing folks, you know, ask me to do at least, you know, put, you know, flash a couple of them. So I will try to make it quick. Um, so PA Semi is, uh, it's a fabulous uh, startup uh, uh, here in, in the Valley in Santa Clara. We have an um, architectural license for power PC from IBM. Uh, that architectural license really is, is just a written spec, so that allows us to um, uh, build a power PC machine from scratch. Uh, and that's what we uh, did uh, to build our first product uh, called the one, the, the family is called the Power Fission um, um, uh, Processors. And we built this computer from scratch. Uh, I remember when I joined uh, PSME back in, in June uh, 2004. Uh, the only tool that we had uh, in the company was Spice, and we only have a couple of licenses, so we had to run our jobs at night. Otherwise, you know, we couldn't run our jobs. And the schematic editor was a uh, freeware that we someone you know downloaded from 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 the net. Anyway, so I think we made a lot of progress. This was you know two and a half years ago, and we are you know sampling our first customers um, you know as we speak. So the progress has been pretty good. So we're about 150 people. Uh, we are uh, you know well uh, funded by. Um, by you know, well-recognized um, um, uh, uh, vendor uh, firms. And we're currently, currently engaged with over 100 customers across different market segments. And I will talk about this in the next slide. Uh, so we are partnered with IBM, as I mentioned before. And we believe that we have a breakthrough uh, process solu solution focused on low power and high performance. Our, our first product is a 2 gigahertz um, product, as is, uh, is, is we call it the system on the chip, because integrates memory and I.O. and two 64-bit uh, 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 power PC on the die. The, the cores run at 2 gigahertz. The rest of the SOC runs at lower frequencies. And we have also uh, 2 megabytes of uh, chip on die. So the total power for the system, this is, a, this is a typical power for the core. The maximum power for the core run in a kind of a, toast, uh, a toaster um, you know, um, application is, is around 7 watts. But typically, uh, you're going to be about half of that. 
the total power for the system is, um, is again, max power is, uh, is around 25 watts, and um, typical power is around 13 watts. Um, so in terms of the markets, the company's targeting is, as you can see, is pretty broad. It goes from um, computer uh, server blades, digital entertainment, <laughs> embedded, embedded applications, router switches, uh, base, uh, base stations for um, uh, telecom storage systems, imaging, and game players. So it's a pretty broad, uh, pretty broad market, and we're currently engaged with customers you know, across all these segments. So that's it really for PSME, if you're interested, www.psme.com. We have some openings too, so just go and check it out. So um, now down to the topic of today. So um, challenges, what are the challenges I think we're facing today and I think we'll keep facing in the next, you know, I think in the next decade in terms of IC design. So most of you are, you know, are you know, familiar with power management you know, and that's, uh, that's what, what our you know, company, PA Semi, uh, you know, um, actually focus on achieving high performance at the minimum por you know, possible you know, power. Uh, however, the next other, you know, challenge, especially as we go into the soup, uh, you know, on, um, um, and micro and technologies, 65, starting in, 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 in really 90 nanometers, you see it more in 65, as you go into 45 and 32, you're going to see more of this, uh, it's, it's process variability. Uh, it, the devices are getting so small, uh, and the tools and, and the, the, are not getting that, you know, are not really keeping pace with the shrinking uh, pace of the devices. So in terms of, it's just, it's just a natural process. As, as the device gets smaller, the variabilities of the devices are going to get more, uh, more prevalent. Um, so um, what the, the three main, main reasons I can identify for this um, for this phenomenon are, are three. Uh, one is, 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 is just, you know, Moore's law. We just keep integrating every two years, two and a half years, we double the number of transistors on, on the die. So we're talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of devices going into the billions of devices and on one single die. And uh, all of them have to work. Not necessarily all of them. Some devices in memory, some, some other type of structures you can, you can uh, replace if they, are not, uh, if they are not, you can switch them or repair them if they are not fully functional. But still you're talking about millions of devices that you put on a single die and they all have to work. So in terms of manufacturing, this is a big challenge. So uh, shrinking devices, you know, again, the geometries are getting really uh, so small. Uh, the oxides, as we can count, you know, in atomic layers, how many layers of oxide we have on the devices. And the number, even the number of dopants, we, we can, you know, it's, it's in the order of, of, of you, know, you know, 10 you know, hundreds, you know, a few hundreds. Uh, you know, dopants under the gate. So if you just miss a few of them, you're talking about var you know, variations on the few, on the few percent, and that, that you know, directly affects you know, the VT of, of the devices. On the other hand, it's a power envelope that is getting tighter and tighter. You want, everybody wants high performance, but everybody also is, it has to fit a you know, tight uh, power budget. So VDD is being pushed down around the volt or so. But the, the VTs are not scaling. If you keep pushing the VT down, your leakage goes up, so you keep the VT more or less constant. But you know, VDD is coming down. So the headroom for the device is getting smaller and smaller, and any variability in VT is going to have a bigger impact on the device. So, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about you know, the sources of power uh, of process variability. Um, uh, in general, they are categorized in two types of variabilities. Uh, the global variabilities uh, they had to do with these five factors here, and they are, you know, die to die within the wafer, uh, could be die, you know, wafer to wafer or lot to lot. And um, they are caused by these, you know, five major um, uh, um, uh, uh, factors here. This is uh, the gate oxide, variability in the gate oxide, variability in, um, in, in width and uh, length of the devices, doping of the end wells and the p-wells, uh, flat, uh, flat band voltage uh, variability, and stress-induced effect. Especially there is a lot of focus now in, in, in stress-induced effect because uh, most um, uh, uh, technology companies are introducing all kinds of stress into the devices uh, to get uh, more performance. And that, that stress, you know, is, is not very well controlled. And these tend to, co tend to cause a lot of variability into the devices. This is, just a topic by itself, and you can talk for hours about that. So I'm going to just mention it here, but I'm gonna, not going to expand too much into that. 
So uh, that type of global changes, you know, in general, you know, they will uh, produce variations that, you know, that will uh, cover, you know, the space of uh, uh, the design or the process, you know, space that the foundry will provide to you, and you end up getting, uh, let's say, fast devices or, 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 you know, typical devices or slow devices, you know, within the process spec. Now, in addition to that, you have within the value, you have variability also between two devices. Okay, so now we talk about you know, mismatch between devices. So then we're talking about within the same device, you take one piece of circuitry within that device, and then you, you are looking at variability between those two devices that might be looking identical, and then they, they could be sitting literally next to each other, but it could be a huge variability between, between both of them. So, um, so this is just to illustrate, you know, some pictures. I don't know how, how, how clear you can see, but uh, I have two pictures here. Uh, this, uh, this is a picture of a 60 SRAM cell from Intel from a 65 nanometer device. Uh, as you can see here, so these are the gates, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So these are the PMOS devices, and these two are the NMOS devices. So if you look at in terms of matching, this device has to match with this. And this device has to match with that, and this device has to match with this device. So as you can see, this by no means is you know a nice straight you know square looking gate. Okay, and you're talking about few nanometers variability here in, in in the width or the length of this device, and this can have a big effect into the way that that memory bit is going to perform. Uh, so uh, also the VT, you know, the VT variation or mismatch between the devices also will have a big impact. And I will show uh, uh, in a few minutes one slide when we talk about the stability of a memory cell. This is another uh, static uh, NAND gate in another process, 65 nanometers. So you can see the NMOS devices and the PMOS devices. You can almost visually see a difference between the gate length of these two devices. And these two are, you know, they were drawn to be identical. Okay? But you can easily get four or five nanometers mismatch between them. And we're talking about channel lengths of um, around 40 nanometers in 65. So three or four nanometers is about 10% variation in the channel lengths. And that translates into changes in VT and changes in the um, car drive current of the device. So um, now, the, uh, this is uh, caused by, you know, by, by, by uh, changes in the, lithog in, in the lithographic uh, 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 process. And the, uh, the thing is that the um, width and length here, they, they can go in opposite directions because the width and the length of the device is, is determined at different steps during, during, during the, um, the um, fabrication. So they are uncorrelated. And uh, the smaller you make the device, it's worse. And it's, uh, so, so, uh, on, the, on the other hand, in order to increase density, you're trying to make your, your devices as small as you can unless you need you know, a bigger drive or some particular devices, but you know, you know, you try to just pack as many devices as you can. So you, you, you go in that direction of making the devices smaller and smaller. Let's talk here you know, for a second about VT mismatch. Uh, these are primarily caused by a random, uh, the, it's called the, the random um, doping effect. So as we talk, the number of, you know, the, the, the devices are so small that, that, that the um, dopants that you put under the channel to, uh, to adjust the VT of the device, you can count them. Is, is probably you know, around 100, 150, or less than 100, okay? And, and, and the VT will, de will also be determined by the way that those opens are placed under the gate, physically, you know, where, in which particular location they are placed. So there is, uh, there is I, I'm quoting here, uh, I'm showing an example from one uh, paper, and I'm giving here the reference, but this is, is called an atomist, atomistic uh, 3D simulation, where actually he has a 3D model for this structure, and he will, uh, with his model, he will place the dopants in different locations, randomly distributed, and then by simulation, he will determine what the VT of the device is. So he provides these nice you know, pictures and examples where he put under the same structure exactly 170 uh, dopants. And as you can see, the, the, the placements of those opens is different, and is, uh, is different under the gate. So he, so, uh, he runs his uh, you know, 3D model, and he gets the VT for this distribution is seven, uh, seven, uh, 780 millivolts, and the VT for this distribution is five, 560 millivolts, almost 200 millivolts mismatch. And these two devices, this is a model, so these two devices are, are you know, uh, physically identical, except that the placement of the dopants is different under the channel. So you can see on this device on top, you have more devices 
uh, toward you know, you, you know, the surface of, of the device. So if it is higher, here you have you know, less devices toward the, you know, the, the surface, so the ability of the device is changing. Now, uh, uh, there was a famous paper published a few years ago that uh, gives uh, the, uh, the author is called Pelgrim, and this is called Pelgrim Law, that established that the, that, that the signal, the variance of the EVT is proportional to one over the square root of the, the area of the device. So uh, if you make the device again B, that variance is going to be small. But you know, that always goes, goes against you know, uh, the goal of making the devices small so you can integrate more of them on, on, on the die. So all those, you know, all those you know, um, trends go uh, against each other in the sense that you try to pack as much, but you get more variability and you get you know, circuits that are uh, less robust. So uh, let's talk about now uh, how you model this. Uh, so uh, most founders will provide statistical models for the devices. And um, uh, the uh, statistical models gives you a more realistic view of what the, the, the process space were, uh, you know, in which the devices are going to be behaving. So traditionally, uh, the um, uh, models, uh, we talk about global variations versus local variations. So some founders will give you one combined model where you have all the, all, all the, all the var sources of variability. Uh, question? Yeah, why don't you finish the slide? I got a question on the previous slide, basically. Sure. So wouldn't that uh, be proportional to the 1 over square root of number of dopants rather than W times L? Because if you had a fixed number of dopants, uh, spread over a bigger area, then you would have more uh, uh, variance. So it, it should be more. It should be proportional to inversely proportional to the number of dopants, isn't it? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, this is a famous. It's called almost the law. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so most designers go with this equation automatically, and uh, what you're saying makes sense to me. But this has been verified. Perhaps, you know, it's just, I I'm thinking whether, you know, the, the amount of dopants, you know, is proportional to the, to the gate area. So probably, you know, how that you, you get you know, the correlation. I think they automatically go by if you have a large area, you have more dopants. Right. If it, you know, the dopant density is about the same. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, so, uh, so what this picture I'm trying to capture is, is a design space. So here we make this two-dimensional to make it, you know, to, 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 to visualize it in, in a better way. So this is your PMOS uh, device, and this is your Edmo device. So the uh, foundry will try to always center the device, uh, what we call, you know, what we usually call typical, typical, typical animals and typical PMOS. But sometimes you're going to get, you know, fast PMOS and, and, and or slow PMOS and same for animals and, and the PMOS. For, for the, the same for the animals, strong, uh, strong animals or weak animals or fast or slow. So you get this kind of square. Now, uh, the, the fab you usually will try to hit you know, you know, or center the process around typical, but you know, there will be excursions. Sometimes you're going to get you know, close to fast, fast, sometimes close to slow, slow. Okay? Now, um, uh, so the tip, when, when you use statistical models, and if you run you know, uh, the, you know, a Monte Carlo simulation, for instance, you, you, the, 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 the simulation will take you around you know, this space. As opposed to use what you know, we call artificial you know, corner models, where you use, let's say, fast PMOS and slow NMOS, and you're going to get, you, know, you can get outside of that design space because it's really not, it's not a realistic corner. Now, um, so this is, you know, um, uh, again, is, is, uh, remember, this is, you know, a die to die, wafer to wafer, and lot to lot type of variability. Now, on top of that, on each of these points, you can get mismatches within the die. And that will give you, you know, on each of these points, that will give you another, you know, multidimensional space where the devices can fall. Okay? So you can be, you know, centered around here in terms of, you know, your lot, let's say, is, is, is a, a typical lot or is a fast lot. But in addition to that, you can get within the die wide, you know, wide excursions, and you can be completely outside of this, of this, you know, space. And now, uh, how much in terms of, you know, the sigmas? Uh, most uh, founders will target the you know, three sigma process, so that you know, this space is going to correspond to a three sigma deviation from the typical. Now, in terms of, you know, the local, this is really, you know, up to uh, 
the process will give you specs in terms of what are the, vari the, the variabilities of the, of the process parameters, but it's up to the designer to decide how many sigmas you want to design, you know, your particular, you know, design to, to meet your you neural know, robustness criteria. So, uh, so that will lead us to the next um, to the next slide. So, how do you do simulations, you know, with statistical models? So, usually, um, uh, what you do is you run Monte Carlo. If you're not familiar with Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo is just involved uh, um, uh, simulating the circuit over a very wide range of um, randomly chosen parameters. Now, the key is, is the word random here. Uh, if the parameters if the parameters are not truly random, you're going to get skewed results. But you know. Um, uh, depend, so the result is going to be as good, you know, as the model, you know, is. Uh, so if you're going to be using Monte Carlo, so you have to assume, and uh, and you have to, you know, work with Foundry to understand, you know, if there is any correlation between between the parameters. Sometimes there is some correlation between the parameters, and that correlation is going to be captured in the model. But this is really important. You understand that. Now, uh, what do you get by running this? You, you, you get the distribution that you can plot and you can analyze in many different ways. You can just plot, you know, uh, a scatter plot, let's say, you know, uh, a VT uh, in one direction, delay, noise in the other direction, and you can also get, you know, uh, distributions. And you can say, well, that's my distribution, that's, you know, the center of the distribution, and you can see what's, what's spread, what's the variability, and you can get, you know, the sigmas of that distribution. Okay? And then we'll see in a second how we use that information. Is it uh, commonly agreed that these are mainly normal distributions, or uh, to, is there a disagreement about what kind of a distribution is that? Uh, no, it's not. No, not necessarily. They, they have to be normal distribution. They can be. They, they can be uh, different. Uh, it's, it's much easier to assume that they are normal. And to a first, you know, to a first order, you know, you can get a lot by assuming so without, you know, you know, being too, 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 too wrong. But not necessarily have to be normal. And it also depends on the, whether the parameters are truly random. Uh, if, they, if they are, in your simulation, you might assume they are truly random, but in, in, in reality, they might not. Because, for example, you know, random dopamine fluctuations is a random thing, but, you know, there are all these spatial correlations and things like that. Right, but some of this you capture on this, you know, so-called global. So the way you do this, you can, you know, you know you, you going back to this, uh, <clears throat> you can... Let's say you, you, you know that the sensitivity of circuit is in this space, so you, you can fix some of these parameters around this corner and then do a mismatch only here. So, uh, so, and that's usually, you know, the way you do it to, to save simulation time. So, uh, so, as you may imagine here, you're talking about thousands of simulations just for, for one particular, you know, condition, and then you want to, uh, you know, look at what happens when you change the voltage, the temperature, and so on. So you're talking about one small circuit, you know, let's say you're analyzing a 60 SRAM transition, you know, memory bit, and you want to just run, you know, Monte Carlo is 500, 1,000 simulations for one run, and then you do 10 temperature sweeps, you do another 10, you know, voltage sweeps, and you end up with 20, 30,000 simulations that will take, depending where you're running, but, you know, it takes a few hours to get the result. And then you want to, oh, what if I change, you know, make a little tweak to this transistor, so it's another two or three hours. So, so this is not something that you can really, you know, run on, you know, on, on a 200 million, you know, device, you know, uh, uh, a chip, you know, to do timing conversions, right? Uh, it's absolutely not, not possible. So, uh, so what you do is you just, you know, limit, you know, this type of analysis to the circuits that are, you know, that are, you know, process sensitive, okay? And there is no better, you know, uh, tool that your own brain, you know, you have just just to make sure that you understand what you are designing, and then just you know apply these techniques to the circuits that have known process sensitivities. So traditionally, you know, when there is races, you know, things that are racing against each other, uh, when there is contention between P and N or N and N or P and P, uh, uh, circuits that you know they are traditionally known, like you know, uh, as, you know, sense amplifiers to be sensitive to mismatch between devices. Now, uh, on the other hand, also had to be circuits that use a lot. I mean, if you have 200 million devices in, in, your, in, your, in your chip, but you only have one particular circuit that is sensitive to process variability, but you only have only a few instances, well, you can be conservative. Just make the circuit very, very robust, make the devices very big, and you don't have to worry about that. So if the usage is really low, you know, you, there are work, you know, ways to work around the problem. Now, uh, if you have you know, you know, half of your transistors or you know, two-thirds 
are in the memory. So well, you know, clearly you have to make sure that you design your memory bit robust enough because you're going to put millions of instances of them. Any other kind of memories, register files, you know, again, you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of bits. You want to make sure that all the bits are functional. Flip-flops, you use hundreds of thousands of them. Sensams, you know, for your memories, you know that, you know, your sensams are particular sensitive to VT mismatch. And also, uh, in terms of timing, you know, we're going to be spending a little bit more time, you know, time also on the second part of this talk, talking, talking about statistical timing. Um, not, you know, all the transistors are in the critical path for, you know, a particular design. So you only apply this type of analysis for the devices that are critical, you know, timing-wise, either for your, for your max timing that determines your max, freq max frequency, or for your, you know, devices that are in, in the so-called mean, uh, 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 mean uh, uh, paths that have to do with race, internal races within, within the circuits. <coughs> so. Um, so the question is, well, I, I, let's say you run your Monte Carlo, you get your distributions, you characterize for a particular circuit behavior that you are trying to model, observe, you get your mean, you get your sigmas, well, you get all this information, now what do you do with it? So the question is, what, you know, what, how many sigmas should I design you know, my, my circuit you know, in terms of robustness? So uh, the criteria that we use is uh, usually uh, you get the mean of the distribution, mu in this case, so uh, um, n is the number of global sigmas. How many you know, global sigmas you are going to be designing for? So if your founder gives you three sigma models, so that's your answer. You, know, you have to make sure that you have a three sigma excursion. You want at least to cover that, right? So usually you know, n is going to be equal to, uh, to three. And then uh, is the number of local sigmas. How much variability do you allow in, in terms of, you know, uh, of your local, uh, local variation? So then, uh, you know, one criteria is, well, look at how many, what I, you know, I was saying before, look how many instances you have. If you have, you know, uh, 10 million, you know, devices or instances of this particular circuit, you want to use the sigma close to five. If you have only, you know, 100 particular instances, you can get away with the sigma, you know, two or three, okay? So uh, let's say if you put one mega, megabyte of SRAM in your, in, your, uh, in your chip, so you do the numbers, you get a sigma close to five. Okay, so you want to design for five sigma. Five sigma is a very large number, if you don't realize, you know. Three sigma is one in, uh, as you can see, three sigma is one in, 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 in the thousands, so five sigma is almost close to one in 10 million. Okay, so you want to make sure you put 10 million of these devices and there will be no one single failure. Okay, this is very, you know, very, you know, tight, really constrained. So, um, so let's just talk about some circuits here. So, um, um, so this is you know a typical you know case where you you want to use uh, you know a, a detailed you know uh, a statistical analysis to make sure that if you're designing a 6T transistor here for your memories that is uh, that is robust enough. So the way that this goes is uh, you're gonna you know decide on the sizing based on the you know layout constraint that you had to fit or the footprint that you're trying to fit. You're going to make all the tricks in terms of width and length for your cell, and then you're going to do the analysis. So you run Monte Carlo, and you're going to get a mean. Let's say you're looking at one particular parameter. Usually when you do a memory cell, you look at your static noise, static noise margin, and you look at your writability. So one has to do, since this cell uses the same ports for read and write, so you have to make sure that when you read from the cell, you don't perturb the cell, and then when you write into the cell a 0 1, you make sure that you know, there is no contention that you can write a 0 or 1. Right, so these two constraints go, goes, you know, they go against each other. So I'm looking, uh, I'm not going to, if you're not familiar with st what static noise margin is, you know, I, you know, there's plenty of literature around. So, uh, but anyway, um, uh, uh, it has to do again with the stability of the cell. So um, and usually you, meet, you measure it in millivolts, and the criteria is that, you know, for a cell to be stable, uh, you, had, you want at least 100 millivolts, 150 millivolts of, of margin. So what you do is you set up your uh, your 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 spice you know deck first to measure uh, what the noise uh, the, the noise margin is, and then you run all your statistical you know simulations. You get your mean, you get your 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 global sigma, and you get your your local sigma. Okay, and then what you do is you can you can plot them in this way. You do this across different temperatures and uh, and and, and voltages. Let's say you already found what the worst temperature is, so you just focus on, on one particular temperature, and then you look at your VDD. You do a sweep on VDD, and you repeat the simulations many times. And can, this can take you know, a couple of days you know, to complete all the simulations, and then you get the plot like this. 
So the blue curve in this case will represent where the mean is. Okay. Then when you subtract from the mean, you subtract your three sigma global. So that will push you into one, you know, corner of your process space from what the foundry, you know, gives you. It could be that in this case, you know, is you know slow, slow, it could be fast, fast. And on top of that, you you decide how many you know, local sigma you want to add to that. Okay? So if we're designing for one megabyte of SRAM, you want to put another five sigma on top of it. And that will give you this curve here. And then you set what your safe margin is for a, for a circuit to be robust. And you know, this could be again 100 millivolts. And you say, well, my static noise margin has to be about you know, that safe margin. That means that my cell is going to be stable about you know, around, above uh, 0.7 volts. But if I try to uh, operate at 0.55 volts, always there will be a few bits that the, they, will be, um, uh, they will be unstable. That means when you're trying to read a zero from that particular bit, the bit will flame and will read you one, or vice versa. Okay? So, um, questions? Sure. So, um, so what are the trade-offs? In, for example, you know, you could do all this very robust design, and you can put all these guard bands for all these sigmas, basically. Instead of doing that, why couldn't you just simply go and put, let's say, ECC or or? Well, you don't want to go ECC there. for it because you want to use ECC for truly, you know, uh, you know, random effects. So yeah, you, you can you can be cheating. But the, the, the good thing about you know memories is that you can swap them, right? That's what I was going to say. You know, memory repair. And you example. you did do that. Okay, but but uh, what what is I don't know if you heard the terms you know, soft soft bits today. I mean, usually if you have a defect, you know, it's, it, that would give you a stack at uh, kind of fault, you know, zero or one, so a bit that is stuck always. You want to read it, but there are a lot of bits that are you know working on some conditions. If you raise VDD, you know, uh, the, the memory will work. But you start going, you know, 100 millivolts to 100 millivolts, you start seeing you know all these soft bits, you know, you know here and there. And so uh, there, is a, there is some amount of repair and redundancy that you want to put, but you know you want to have you know the majority of your devices working, and then the few ones that are you know the, the, the ones that are broken, you just have to replace them, right? But you have a lot of soft you know soft also bits, and, and and otherwise you know your 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 repair scheme also becomes you know very expensive and. Right. So what I was asking is, what's the trade-off that how much to do in design and how much to deal with it by Correction either through repair or whatever way, you know, like what's the? Uh, I, I can't give you, I can't give you a number, but you know, repair. I mean, repair is, is um, redundancy is, is is not free, right? You know, uh, it, it adds you know cost, complexity, timing also, uh, timing also, you know, you know, depending how you implement it, but um, and also depends on the granularity, you know, how many chunks you know you're gonna select and so on. Uh, most of the time, you're gonna just you know uh, you know you know work with your foundry. And um, and you know they will give you recommendations, and you will decide. You know, uh, most of the time you're not going to design your own memory bit, you know, either, right? So uh, now the other thing is that this is true for memories. The good thing is about memories is is that you, you write the content into the memory, right? So well, you know, you get a broken you know bit, so you just replace it and you write somewhere else. Well, but you can't do this with logic, right? And uh, how much is in the memory? How much is in logic? Well, with logic is hard coded, right? So unless you put really additional you know hardware redundant hardware, right, you know, it can get pretty expensive. So this is another circuit where, uh, in this case, you know, um, uh, we're talking about the sense amplifier here. So the sense amplifier, you know, you are going to use it, you know, in your memories to read your, you know, bit and, 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 and bit, uh, bit bar and based on small uh, delta between uh, your complementary bits, you're going to decide in which sense uh, in which direction the sense amp will go. So this is a circuit that has high gain and with small, uh, you know, about 100 millivolts uh, differential in, 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 in the inputs, uh, the circuit has to resolve in one direction or the other direction. So what is critical here is, is what is the VT mismatch between these two devices. So um, if, the, if, you, if you get 100 millivolts of, of, of VT mismatch, well, you have to wait at least you know, until your bit lines will differentiate by 100 millivolts before you can you can fire the sense amp, and that translates into you know timing. Right? That means you have to wait longer to be able to read your memories. So in this circuit, you know, the the, the the mismatch between these two devices is really the key. 
So, uh, so, so how do you uh, de de decide how much differential you need? Okay. So uh, the way you do this is again you you run in here in, in this case this kind of circuit is almost independent on which corner you're going to run it, whether you are in the fast fast slow slow. Uh, it's, it's almost independent of that you can just run a mismatch simulation here with your mismatch parameters. And what you can do is get, you know, a, a, you know an accumulated you know, probability of failure that will look this way. So uh, if everything would be uh, you know, nominal, this circuit can resolve one millivolt of differential, right? But when you start getting all the mismatches you know, between the devices, you can see that you know, to get a probability of resolving a differential, with 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 100 you know 100% certainty you need you know to to be above you know 100 millivolts or so so what you do you get this type of distribution you know from this distribution you look at you know 84% or so you get your one sigma and then you decide well i need to design i have you know 20,000 or 50,000 of this circuit so you know it's about four sigmas right so if one sigma is about 25 millivolts four sigma is is 100 and that's what you need to do Now, uh, it's not only in terms of speed uh, when you're designing the memory, it's not only your sense amp. Remember that you know, your memory bit can also be weak. Okay? So you can be unlucky and you can have a sense amp that has a lot of offset in one direction and you are reading you know, a memory that is very weak on, the, on, on reading your zero or one. So you also have to look at what is the, you know, the variability of your read current and then combine the two and that's going to tell you how much differential you need. If you ignore you know, one of the two, uh, you are only solving half of your problem. So uh, with this formula here, suggested here, you can combine the sigmas on your, of your memory bit with the sigmas of your, on your sense amp, combine the sigmas, and decide you know, how much differential you need. So can we pause just for a minute and talk about the rationale for using a large sigma in design? Yeah. You've said that you have sense amp cells, and because you have so many of them on the chip, you choose a large sigma. Correct. And now, if Maybe it's just my understanding that needs fixed on this. That's because you have so many of them, you multiply the probabilities of failure together, and it looks likely that at least one of them will fail if you have so many. Right. But that's assuming the normal distribution. Correct. So the other side of this is that you say that if you have only a few of something, you don't need a large sigma for the design. Um, but you make lots and lots of these chips. And yeah, but the, you know, the, how can you the be so sure that you can get by with a low sigma for other parts of the design? That's why you have two sigmas. Right, so that's why we, we split between what we call the global sigmas and the local sigmas. So you look at the, the defects that will cause a local mismatch, and that's what you're design, designing for within the particular die. And then you can move that you know, on your global space to make sure that when you combine the two, you get you know, a robust design across different wafers, different lots, or different foundries. Does that answer the question? So you have simulation and fab experience that supports the assumptions that you make with this? I'll show some, some, some test circuits that we designed uh, to measure some of that. So other uh, possible uh, applications uh, for statistical design, well, there is quite a lot. They just showed two circuits. and I, I, I didn't want to go too much into circuits, but pretty much you know, a um, lot, lot of circuits in today, you know, digital, you know, circuits, you know, are sensitive to process. Okay, so I just mentioned some of them here. Dynamic logic, you know, all your memories, most of the memories in, in pretty much any processor has some amount of dynamic logic, you know. So um, you have, it's not truly dynamic, you have devices, you know, pre-charge, you know, bit lines, and you have some devices that had to hold the charge. And so if there is a device that has to hold the charge, you have to make sure that the device is trying to pull down that bit line, you know, doesn't get into a fight with the device it's trying to hold. So you have some kind of contention there. Latches, again, depends how you design your latches. You can design your latches contention free, but contention free means that you have to use clock or some type of, you know, gating device that when you're writing into the latch, you open, you know, you open the feedback, uh, you know, circuit that costs you more power. So sometimes you don't want to design with that, and then you have contention, and then you have to make sure that you design for something that is going to be, it's going to be contention free. Uh, register files, exactly for the same reason. You don't, you want to use, you can make a you know, memory bit that use 20 transistors, and it's absolutely robust, right? But you, you want to use a 60, 
you know, memory bit for your, you know, non-foundry memory bits for the same reason of, you know, uh, integration. Uh, pulse flops, uh, this is, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's, it's, it's like a latch um, and it has a very narrow pulse that will just open and will allow you to write into the flop. So it, it's faster than the flip flop because instead of having master and slay, you only have one. So the circuit opens for a very short period of time and then it closes. So what you want to make sure is that, you know, when it opens, it stays open, right? So you use a pulse generator to generate that pulse. Well, that's pulse generation, you generate, you know, you have to make sure that the devices that will generate the pulse with all the mismatches, always you get a pulse. So level shifters, uh, today, nowadays, you know, in order to manage power, you have different power domains on your chip. Every time you go from one domain to the other domain, you use level shifters. Um, I don't have any schematics for one of them, but you know, those circuits have contention. You have to make sure that they work within you know, the, you know, the, the, the um, uh, um, uh, power you know, spec in terms of uh, the, um, the, 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 the delta between the different power domains. Most analog circuits are sensitive also to mismatches. You know, so this is a traditional application for this type of analysis. Now, so the advantages uh, is that when you introduce statistics um, uh, in the past, you know, the way that those, you know, you, know, you would design the circuit, you will say, well, you know, uh, you will get some idea of how much mismatch, you know, the circuit will have, and you will just put, let's say, 50 millivolts of mismatch for this circuit, you know, I make sure that this circuit will work, will work fine. Well, uh, but, and that circuit, well, you know, you use a little bit of experience, you know, gut feeling, and you just tweak the device and say this circuit is robust, is robust enough. But there is no way to really put, you know, a number into it, how, how robust it is. With sigma, it's clear, you know, you are designing for one sigma, you are designing for six sigma. So what you do is you say, well, I designed for five sigma all my, all my circuits, right? So you know that you have the same degree of robustness for the circuits, and you don't have, you know, your, a weak link in, in your design. On the other hand, you're not over designed some circuits that don't need to be over designed, right? So you just define your sigma, and then you know all the circuits design around the same the same criteria. <coughs> so uh, and now we're going to just switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about statistical timing. So. Um, uh, for the same reason that we talked about before, uh, you are used as you know, thinking of a dynamic you know, of a, uh, you know, logic gate has having you know a timing model and is so many you know picoseconds or nanoseconds of delay between any of the arcs. Well, uh, in terms of mismatch uh, or statistical speaking, you, you actually have you know for every gate you have a mean value and then you have a distribution, you have a sigma, a variance around it. Okay, so the way to think about this, instead of, of, of thinking of adding just numbers, you have to add distributions. Okay, so for any path, actually, for any path in your in your when you're doing stat, you know, st your static time analysis, you can actually you know get you know your mean for the path, and also you can get get the variance. Uh, and one way to get the variance for you know in, when you're doing timing is if you have the variance of each of the components, you can get the variance for the for the um, for the for the for the total path. So uh, same, same thing that we talked before. You get your global distribution, and on top of your global distribution, you get your, 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 your local mismatch. So uh, uh, from your local mismatch, you can, you can, you can derive your, uh, your probability function. And with your probability function, you can determine uh, what's the probability that the part, let's say that you know, you're getting this distribution, and, uh, and, and you want to see, well, uh, I'm going to lose some of this distribution because there is a 50% chance that is, there will be variance that will push you me that will push your design outside of the distribution, right? So, and you get the variance not only for one device. You get you know, you know tens of tens of thousands of critical paths in your circuit, right? So you can you have to multiply that probability by twenty or thirty or hundred thousand, right? And and if you do the math correctly, you can actually see how much of this curve will actually eat from this curve here. Okay. So we build a model, uh, you know, uh, based on this concept, and, and what we define is what we call the OCV ratio. So OCV stands for on-chip variability, and the OCV ratio is defined as the local variability versus the global variability. We are talking about, you know, two distributions here, you know, one, you know, eating part of the other distribution, and one of them is multiplied by the number of critical paths you have in your design. So uh, it turned out that, you know, if you do the math and you you compute, you know, the, your, the, the probabilities. You can see how much you're going to lose. You're going to be losing the distribution based on that ratio. 
okay? So if that ratio is equal to one, uh, you are here on the yellow curve here. So the yellow curve is part of the distribution that is going to yield. We're talking about speed here, okay? So yield means it's going to be about your speed target. Let's say you design your speed target at the end of your three sigma, okay? So you're gonna be losing all this part of the distribution because of this local variability. Now, if that ratio is equal to two, that means that your local variance is, is larger than your global variance, okay? You're gonna lose you know, a, big chunk of, a big chunk of the distribution, pretty much all of it. That means you design your circuit to be, you know, to meet your speed target of you know, one gigahertz, two gigahertz, or five gigahertz, and based on your timing analysis, you are, you know, you are good, you tape out, you get your chips packs, and you start getting and looking at what kind of you know, speed you get from the fab, and you find that you, from all the chips that you are f manufacturing, you get only 10% of them meeting your speed. And you say, how come? You know, based on all my timing analysis, you know, everything should be yielding, you know, and you get very you know, poor yields because of that. Now, how do you know what's, your, what's that ratio? Well, you, know, that's, you can measure. You can measure what kind of distribution. You can use test structures, or you can actually use you know, real, real um, test structures is, is better because you know you can put the same structure you know all over the die and you can see what type of variance you get you know as you move on, you know across the die. But the but but the message here is that you know you can have a very clean design that meets all your you know timing you know goals and and but when you start getting you know material from the fab you see that your distributions are very you know uh, suboptimal or below below target. So this is also an interesting example here. Uh, so uh, not only is, 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 is the, the variability that will determine what kind of speed, speed distributions you get, but also depends on, you know, your, the timing histogram has a big, you know, impact on that, you know, on that yield. And so I, 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 this, I showed two examples here. And the first example is something that you, you know, you would expect. You know, you get this type of timing distribution, so that means uh, um, in this, in this, for this particular histogram, zero, mean, uh, zero, zero means that you meet, uh, you meet uh, nothing is exceeding your timing uh, target, um, or in terms of you know, delay. Uh, then uh, slack 30 means you have 100 pass that have, uh, uh, or 10, 10 pass with zero slack, 100 pass with uh, 30 picosecond slack. And then you get, you know, it goes exponentially to 1,000 and 10,000. But everything is having zero slack or positive slack in this example. So here is a similar example where uh, you know uh, you get you know your your timing histogram is pushed by 30 picoseconds, and in this case it's pushed in the other direction by by, 50, by 30 picoseconds. So you can see that you know based on these uh, numbers, you know uh, your yields are going to be very different. That we're talking about you know speed yield, how many parts are going to work at speed from what you know you are getting, and that's that's what you expect, right? Well, if you work harder and you push your timing farther, you know, harder, you get, you know, better yields. And if you don't work as hard, you get, you know, you know, uh, worse yields. However, you know, if you massage these histograms, you can actually get, you know, very surprising results. So in this case, um, uh, this shows, um, um, this is similar to this case. The only thing that we changed, you know, the OCV ratio to 0.9 from 1.5. And what this shows here is that if you look at this tiny histogram here, you move a lot of paths from this bucket into the next bucket, meaning you're just pushing a lot of paths into the next bin. So now you will think that here you're going to get a faster, faster, a faster die. Well, it might be in a few cases, but if you look at your distribution, statistically, statistically speaking, these two distributions are identical. You get the same yield. In paper, it looks like you have a faster design. But because you put a lot of these paths into this bucket, and because of the variability that you get, you know, locally, a lot of these buckets are going to spill into this bucket. And if you have a few spills into this one, if you only got 10 spills, you're done. You have the same yield, okay? Now, on the other hand, if you only have one or two bad guys here, statistically speaking, it doesn't matter, okay? You get the same yield, okay? So that means that you can have, you know, and, you know, you're working and you're working against schedule and you have to tape out and you have to tape out, you know, tomorrow and you have, you know, two or three parts that don't meet, you know, your timing goal. Should you tape out? It should work another two months to try to push this, you know, into your, you know, and meet your timing goals. Well, the answer is sometimes that doesn't make any sense at all. Because statistically speaking, all these three designs are identical. 
this takes you know x times to 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 complete this takes x time plus two months this takes you know x minus two months so probably you're better off doing this you're going to tape out you know four months faster than this and get the same type of result and four months is a lot of you know is a lot of money you know at our company we we spend about three million dollars a month you know <laughs> so um one more thing about you know, statistical timing here. The other thing that you want to do uh, on every, pretty much every single design, digital design, is, is uh, you have um, uh, a synchronous design, you have races between flops. Okay? You have one flop that is trying to update you know, a value, there is another flop that has to first sample that value be before it gets updated, and now there is a race. Both of these flops get the clock, so the clock can race you know, the, uh, through two different paths. One could be getting the clock sooner, the other one later, and then you get races, right? So you all, if you took a digital you know, class before, you, you probably are familiar with the concept. So traditionally, the way that you margin the design, if you have you know, one arc and another arc, what you want to do is pad this arc to make sure that you have enough padding so this arc is going to be as long as this by some margin, right? Usually the way you do it is you say, well, I put you know, some margin, 10%, 20%, to make sure that if this path gets faster then this path uh, you know, still you win the race, right? How, how people decide whether 10 or 20% is good? Well, most people work, you know, for 10 years and someone else told them use 10%, you're going to be fine. Some people use 25%, you're going to be fine. Now, the, the more conservative you are, of course, is more robust, but you have to put more padding, right? So more padding means more, more, more area, more power, bigger, you know, uh, uh, blocks and so on. So uh, now if you think statistically, uh, you, you can say, well, instead of putting just a percentage, you know that you know your sigmas they don't add up linearly right you have to sum square them right so they follow a, a square root you know law right if this is truly random so um, if you instead of just using the linear you know sum you just use the sum square well it turn out that you go you know with a much more you know less conservative uh, you know approach that you know follow physics so what you end up getting is a curve that instead of having you know what we call a flat margin as you have more logic into these two timing arcs, you can reduce, percentage-wise, you can reduce your percentage. Of course, if you make things longer, you're going to have more variance. But if you talk about the percentage, you know, the longer the path, you know, the lower the percentage. So you get these type of curves. And it can save you a lot, a lot of, you know, effort in, in fixing this type of, um, uh, you know, races, especially uh, in um, circuits that integrate a lot of, uh, you know, uh, units uh, like you know, like a, like a system on the chip, because you have your clock that goes, you know, uh, from one side of the die to the other die. It takes two or three cycles to get there. You have tons of you know clock delays, and if you just put a few percent of, in terms of you know margin, you have to put a lot of padding, you know, to to, to meet those races. So, um, and the other thing that you can do, all this, you know, you can actually, you don't have to use your kind of, you know, you know, my historical 10, 20 percent number. You can actually go and measure all these numbers. And you can know precisely from your statistical model how much margin you need. And the other thing here is also, uh, once you have the model, the model you know, will be also sensitive to voltage. And as you, we talk about, we talk in the introduction, as you lower your voltage, uh, your variance gets worse. So you can actually predict precisely with your models how much margin you need without, margin you need without you know, having to be uh, conservative. Okay, so I'll try to speed up a little bit. So uh, someone was asking if, if if we have find any correlation between all this theory and the and and, and silicon data, and the answer is yes. We we built um, a, a, um, one test circuit in 65 nanometer uh, to um, to verify you know whether are the statistical models provided by the fab uh, are uh, you know um, are correct and valid and also to determine design margins and to make some proje projections about yield. So uh, one of the test structures that we use is we call it a racer. It's a secret actually uh, we, we talked about before you know trying to avoid races. Here we try to create a race. So what we do is we send a clock signal to one uh, sending flop that generates um, zeros and ones and then what we do uh, we, we, we use a delay, uh, a, a delay vernier and we sample the receiving signal in, in, in many flops. So instead of moving, so the clock edges and, and the data is going to move because of variability. So uh, instead of moving the clock, try to sample and see where the signal is, okay? Instead of moving the clock, we move the data, okay? It's kind of a similar concept. 
And what, then they will do some logic here, and then we get you know, a leading one type of you know, result here, signature. So depending on the variability that you get in all the circuitry from the point where you injected your clock, this leading one here is going to move up and down. So you take the circuit that is identical, you put it next to it, OK? You, 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 run this, you, know, you run the circuit, collect the data, you will see that the one is at different locations. And that represents you know, the process spread that you have in the circuit. So I put in, uh, so what we do here, of course, we do measurements at different voltages and, this, and different temperatures. So uh, these uh, this, uh, um, diagrams here show the spread in that position of the leading one. So what we do is we put hundreds of these uh, you know, uh, test structures on the die and different places on the die, and then we measure each of them, and then we create this type of distributions. So you get, you know, uh, uh, you get this type of spreads, and as you can see here, as you reduce the voltage, look at how the spread goes from a kind of tight spread to a very wide spread. And this is because you push down your VDD, your VDD minus VT margin gets you know, squeezed, and you get a lot of variability. Okay? So this spread can make your circuit fail if you didn't put enough margin into it. So on the same token, you can actually create from, from this data, you know how many races you have in your circuit. If you have you know, your, your net list, you run your timing analysis and so on, you know how many races you have. You have you know, 10 or 20,000 races. You know how much margin you put, you put into, into each of these races. So you can predict at each, at each particular voltage when, when uh, you know, your circuit is going to fail. So uh, this number of inverters really means here the margin that you put into the races. So then you can make you know, predictions of how many yields you're going to get across different voltages. This is uh, this is actually real data from from silicon. It look very gassy, <laughs> because it's very discreet, yeah. <laughs> right? And it, the vernier has only nine um, nine inverts, right? So we, we could have been more sophisticated and used a much fine resolution, uh, but we thought it was good enough. Slightly fun, yeah. yeah. So, question: Did you measure this on your actual product, or is this not test chip? This is a test chip. And how do you know that the variability is the same in the test chip? Than in your product. Well, we put it in a test chip and we collect a lot of wafer data so we could see how things are progressing in time. But does it depend on the, on, on the actual circuit, on the layers and the processors and so Well, the process is the same. The only thing that gets, you know, the process can be tweaked as you, you know, the process gets better. But the variability doesn't change a lot. That's not. It gets a little bit better. But so it doesn't better. vary like if you have two metal wires close to each other? versus, or two transistors close to each other versus far apart, or, or the transistor so density. Things, or for instance, the transistor density seems like that would affect. Uh, the, yeah, but we put this test right. structure, let's say, on the test chip, right? And, and again, it's a test structure. It's not the real thing, right? So uh, you're asking me whether that would be different on the real chip. Yeah, there will be some differences, because each, each of these instances is going to be different. But in terms of the variability, the, the, the intrinsic variability in the process is not changing a lot. I think what he's asking is whether, you know, like sometimes the geometries around. Yeah, of course. I mean, we talk about, you know, uh, you know layout induced, uh, you know, stress or, you know, the manufacturing induced stress that will affect the devices in many different ways. And each, each transistor that you put on a piece of silicon is unique. So in that sense, you know, there will be, there will be differences. But you are talking, you're playing statistics here, right? So you get statistical data, you use that data to apply margin to your circuit. You try to be a little bit conservative, but not too much, okay? But statistically speaking, you know. Right, I guess that's the question. It's how do you know the sigmas are the same? The same, well, we, we measure on, on, on in different points in time, and we collect wafer data, so we collect tons of data, and we can see what happens in time. Yeah, I mean, months, you know, January, February, March, there are tons of material going through the fab, and every time you know we take you know samples and we measure, and then we can see whether in time the, the signals are getting tighter or not. And we saw some of the data getting a little bit tighter, and that's good, okay. But you have to make decisions you know, a year or two years before you know you're getting silicon back. So uh, you can't just predict exactly what the process is going to be, but you know the the the, 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 the time line doesn't have a lot of impact on the variability that you're going to see in the silicon. This is, again, is, is dominated by lito, dominated by, by physics, dominated by you know, 
physical you know, sicknesses. So once the process you know, is defined, there's not going to be a lot of you know, variability. Have these test chips on the same wafers that you run with your production parts? Are you monitoring? I'm not sure I can answer that. In process. <laughs> uh, well, we're on TV, so uh, maybe yes. Yeah. But any change that you might make at that point would be very expensive if you have to make mass changes to respond to the variation. Of course. I mean, once you design your design margins, you are you have to get it right. I mean, look, I mean. I don't know how many of you have designed processes before. I mean, always there are sometimes bugs, one race, one margin that's not going to be right, and you have to fix it, okay? But you don't want to have a mass, you don't want to have a systematic problem that you power up your circuit and when you run it, let's say, at 1.1 volt, and your circuits don't work because, you know, you have, you know, you don't have enough margin. Well, most of these circuits that had to do with these type of issues go away when you raise your supply, you gain, you know, you know headroom. Well, now your circuit works, but you had to use 1.4 volt instead of 1, and your power doubled, you know? So unless you go and fix that, and you, you can go and fix a few circuits, but you can go, if you got, you know, your margins wrong, you get, you know, you're in trouble. Okay, so um, I'm trying just to speed up a little bit here. I think we're going to make it in time, but this is another interesting circuit that uh, many of, we talk about, you know, having dynamic structures that are sensitive to leakage, right? So, uh, well, it turns out that when the fab specs the leakage, it gives you the leakage for a, a given, you know, corner, okay? And says, the leakage for this, for your transistor is so much under this condition. Let's say it's, it's a strong device and at some temperature it's going to leak so many nanoamps per micron, okay? Well, I mean, uh, you, all the, we were just saying the devices are not the same, right? So some devices have a little bit cha you know, shorter channel lines, some devices will have longer. The VT is going to be mismatching also. Your leakage is going to be, it's going to have a distribution, right? So we were trying just to capture once, the fab is going to tell us this, but there will be devices that will be 10 times leakier, right? We have to make sure that if we get those devices in my memories, then the, my, my memory still will work. So what we did, uh, it's very hard to, to measure leakage because you have to, usually the way the fab will do it, will just put some test structures, you know, with, uh, you know, a, a prop pads, and then you put some needles, get IV curves, and then see how much, you know, leakage you get. Well, uh, if you want to do this statistically, it's very hard to collect that type of data. So what we, that, what we decided to do was to put, you know, a, a digital leaker measurement, you know, surrogate. And what we do is we just use an inverter, and what we do is we, we put the leaking, uh, the, uh, in this case, this device is off and this device is on. So what we, we put is this device much bigger than this. Let's say 10 times, 200, 1,000 times bigger, okay? And what we do is we, we build, a, again, a kind of vernier. And we sense this with, a, with an inverter. And we latch into the flop. So at some point, if this is 1,000 times lar larger than this, and if the leakage of this is about 1,000, the, you know, the on current of this device, this inverter is going to just you know, give you a zero instead of one, vice versa. Right. So what we do here is again, you look at the leading one. You know, you know what the leakage ratio between on and off is. It's just the, le the leakage, the off of one device versus the on of a, of a different of another device. That gives you an idea of where you are in terms of leakage. You have another set of other right. So what we do is we go and again you know, put these leaker devices in many places, you know, and then you can get distributions of leakage on the die, right? And this is for your, you know, regular VT, this is for your high VT, and this is for your LVT. So as you see, this is a log scale. As you see, you know, you expect your low VT device to be leakier, and you see it's leakier, and your high VT device is less leakier, and it's less leakier. But you see, you get, you know, those tails, and you can have, you know, green device that is a high VT device that is leakier than, you know, a low VT device that is on this part of the distribution. Right? The tails actually intersect, right? So you might be thinking that you're safe because you're using a high VT device at this low leakage device. Well, you might be safe if you design with enough margin and if you understand what kind of variability you have to make sure that you're designing for the tail, right? And how many, how, how far, you know, again, how many sigmas, depending again, how many instances of your circuit you will have to decide, you know, how much margin you want to put. And what you can do again is take, you know, the means of the sigmas and then say, well, I want to design for four sigma, so you get uh, this type of charge, you know, versus VDD, and you say, well, I can tolerate, you know, so much, you know, ion, ion, ion ratio, 
and then you can say, well, above this, above this voltage, I'm going to be fine. Below this voltage, I'm going to lose. The interesting thing here is, is again, low VDD is a problem, no high VDD. You, you think leakage, well, I raise my VDD, right? I'm going to make everything leakier. Well, when you raise the temperature, that's true. But when you raise voltage, actually, you're fine. It's usually the low VDD that causes this kind of you know, variability to get you know, worse. And we want to go low VDD, right? We don't want to go high VDD, right, because of power. So to make the chips work, you know, sub, you know, sub one volt is really, really tough. So um, other applications for statistical timing, uh, we talk about, you know, uh, sorry, statistical design, we talk about timing, power, for the same reason we talk about variability in leakage, you know, if you're dominated by leakage, you, you want to use statistics when you do your power analysis for design rules, for the same th things that we saw before, right? You can have one circuit that is marginally, you know, passing your, your, your design rules. But if this is one in a wide distribution, you can let it go and you're going to be fine. You want to look at where the distribution really is. Or you're talking about you know, reliability, EM. Well, you have a few wires that don't meet your EM limit. Are you going to just work and, you know, another month to go and fix all your EM problems? Don't bother. You know, statistically, it's irrelevant. Just tape out, right? Again, look at your distributions. Run time, what's the challenge? Run time, you can do this. Takes you know, unless you have a very you know fast you know machine or tons of them, you know it's very very expensive. The tools have to be you know understand you know the context. You know you you, get, you just can't look at one transistor individually. You have to look at the, at the millions of tens of thousands of transistors to understand you know what decisions to make about you know when you're meeting a rule when you're not meeting the rule. You can use statistical approaches. You don't have to run Monte Carlo, but you can use some of the you know we talk about you know following square root you know as opposed to linear, you know, a linear, a linear law to, to margin races. Uh, in terms of, you know, cell-based design, and instead of looking at means, you had to, you know, make sure that your tools produce means and segments. For transistor-level designs, it's trickier. You have, you know, one memory, one cache that has, you know, 200,000 devices. How do you get statistics from, you know, 200,000 transistors? It's kind of hard. You can think of, you know, doing in-situ characterization. We talk about you know ERC and reliability. Again, waivers can be you know if they have no yield impact, you just wave a lot of stuff. And the issue here is yield. You know we need tools that you know should be able to predict yield. We want to know our manufacturing yield. We want to know our functional yield. We want to know our speed yield. That's really what drives the cost, right? So if the tools cannot help you with that, you know there's a big need for this kind of tools. We have today you know some DFM, DFM tools that will tell you how manufacturable your design is, but really, you know, everything translates into dollars, right? We had to know what, you know, our overall yield, you know, should be. And the, and the, and the, the important thing here is, is validation with silicon. We want to make, use these tools and make sure that we get, you know, better yields by using them. So summary, uh, ignoring process variability. If you ignore process variability today in 65 and beyond, you are, you know, you're, you are, you are, you are for a big surprise. Uh, design for yield will become more relevant because of all the trends that we just saw, right? VDD is going down, devices are shrinking, you put more devices and die, right? So if Moore's law con continues and seems to, you know, that it's going to go for another 10 years or so, this will just get worse. Uh, we talk about, you know, handling uh, all this at, at the circuit level, right? But clearly, you know, we have to start thinking of, you know, moving these concepts to a higher level of, of, of the design. You want to start thinking when you, you design your system at the system level, you know, what kind of redundancy I'm going to have on my circuit to handle all these type of variations and still get, you know, functional silicon. So uh, future design, some of them already do it, but, you know, future design you're going to see fairly, more fairly common with the amount of, you know, transistor you can put there. You can just dedicate small percentage, 10% for redundancy outside of your logic. I think it's a well spent, you know, budget. So we're talking about self-checking logic, self-correcting logic, with real logic besides, you know, the SRAM, SRAMs and memories, and where are compensation mechanisms? We didn't talk about, you know, um, uh, reliability, you know, parametric shifts and so on, but, you know, this type of stuff is going to be fairly common in the, in the future, you know, future generations of products. I think we, we're in time. Sure. Any questions? 
contract between somebody like you and a fabulous I mean, a, a designer and, and the, the factory that owns it. Years ago, somebody explained to me that for data rays, uh, you know, the, the contract was in one hand the design and the test package. And the software at the manufacturing company was capable of analyzing the test vectors and saying, yep, it's going to work. Uh, but this, this seems much more complicated than that. It is. And, and, and each company will have, I guess, different type of deals with, with Foundry. But some Foundries are very you know, um, possessive of this type of information, and you're not going to get that. So um, the engagement that we have, we have access to a lot of Foundry information. If you're in the high performance business, you know, low power, ultra low power, you can do it without it. So it's, it's, it's a good question, and, and I, don't, I don't know what the answer is for, I guess there are different types of engagements. But uh, without having this type of information, I think it's very hard to design something very, you know, very aggressive, either performance-wise or you know, power. If you want to push your design below a vault, you know, um, it's very hard to do it without this. Well, this must make an you know, incredibly complicated contract. Well, if you just get statistical models, you, know, you, you can get a you know, long way with that, and many foundries do. Foundry as part of foundry service. But even even if I get the statistical models, I mean, even even if the foundry has good statistical models, okay, the design is so complicated that that when you you know throw the design over over the, the wall, uh, how do you decide whether that met the con the terms of the contract? Well, I don't know. It depends on you. If you're a bit bold, if you're, if you, the question is, who is driving the yield, right? Is you paying for the yield loss or is the foundry? So that, I guess, depends on the kind of engagement that you have. If you're buying, if you're buying wafers, right, it's one thing. If you're buying, you're buying chips, you don't care if the yield is low. So the cost is on the foundry. Depends on how, how many parts you buy. Usually, when you buy wafers, you know, the yields go low. When you buy units, you know, yields go high. So, but basically, if you design your own test chips or do your own characterization, you should have more under control. Yeah, absolutely. So it's basically a contract with yourself rather yeah. than having to gamble on the. Right. I think it's very hard to go today into kind of leading edge, you know, type of design without making a test chip before. And this type of things, you want to, you know, Try it first. I mean, in, in, you can test chips on chips for production, basically. Then you can keep on tracking. You, uh, that's what you have to do, right? Because you put it on the, your product, you keep tracking on that. When you design previous, you know, the next product, you know, you already at least have data from previous node and tons of it. That's what you need to do. Okay. These type of structures, you know, they are, they are very cheap, and you can put tons mm -hmm. of this stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's just on the, you know, on the, on the, on the, on the white holes that you have in your design, you can place tons of them. You have to hook them up and you know and so on, but it's a little bit of a hassle, but you know, you can you can get tons of information. Also as you hinted, you can even check the production uh, chip value it's running. Yeah. Absolutely. That's interesting. Absolutely. I used to say that when they start talking about yield that why don't we build a test on the memory and it checks itself as it ages so it makes more memory available. Oh absolutely. Absolutely, and I think so this you're is basically there. Oh, no. uh, you're you're very close to be there, you know. And there are really, I think, you know. It used to be a joke. Way back. Yeah, no, but you know, I, you know, MBTI and all these kind of things will make a lot of these weak bits. So when you start getting shift, and this takes you know, a few years sometimes to kick in, you know, you just do a little bit of back bias, and then you're fine, you know. So all these kind of things, you know, I think are already, you know, out there. So do you do uh, dynamic adjustments to compensate for variability? You could. <laughs> Now, the things with this kind of compensation is, is a lot of the, you know, someone was talking about what kind of engagement you have with the fund. I mean, you give a GDS, right, and you give vectors, you know, and pass or fail, right? So when you have all this type of dynamic time, you know, compensation, wear out compensation, uh, how do you know whether, you know, time goes by, right? So how do you, how do you test for the part, right? Uh, you know, you, you test at time zero, right? But the thing will age with time, right? Is that your problem? Is the foundry problem? The circuits stop working after a while, right? You have field failures. Well, that's why it has to be designed it. Right. The test has to be designed in the part. Right. 
So I think it, right. So I think it opens up you know many interesting questions. For, but you know, if you're selling a product, you know, it's hard to you know say, well, is my fund rate, you know, my device, you know, shifted too much, and you, know, you as a designer need to understand that and design for that. So we have about just one more minute left. So I'll ask one final question. Sure. You mentioned that tools to predict yield are needed now. Um, what kind of research work do you see being done in terms of a tool that cannot just look at a single transistor or look at the big picture like you described? And what kind of research areas do you think that students could be looking at? Uh, I think statistical time is kind of hot. I mean, there are a bunch of companies today doing that, and big companies, small companies. So I think there's a lot going on there, statistical timing. Um, uh, there is a lot of DFM companies also. It's, it's kind of similar concept, but applied to the physical, you know, uh, design rules and lithographic processes. Um, we talk about, you know, electromigration, noise analysis, these kind of tools also, you know, you need reliability. It's all statistics, really. You know, all those areas, I think, you know, are interesting areas for research. And to me, you know, eventually everything translates into, into, you know, dollars. So integration of all these tools, and, and, and the thing is also validation, you know. Um, these tools cost money to develop, you know, to buy, to install, deploy, use, and so on. So if, if you're going to be using something that is called DFM that will give you better manufacturing of your product, right, you want to just see hard evidence, right? So how do you convince that what you're doing is going to give you better yields? Usually you don't try one, one way and the other one without it, right, and see which one is yielding better, right? You have to make a decision whether you're going to buy a tool because you think you're going to improve your yields. So uh, I would be very interested to, to see what can be done in terms of research. And this is something that you can, I think, do a lot on, 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 on an academic environment. So it sounds like all the doublies or other folks working on circuits are going to need to have statistics minors going forward. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, sure. All right, well, thank you very much. Sure. Okay. okay. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.